chapter 30, and as we do so, of course, we are focusing on some chapters in the Bible that show the dramatic revival and turnaround in the nation of Judah primarily, but also I was able to reach uh, a lot of people in Israel as well, the northern ten tribes. Uh, the two southern tribes of Judah is the, is the tribes that made up the area around Jerusalem. And of course, uh, God had commanded uh, the people to come to Jerusalem, uh, particularly the, the males had to come three times a year, and uh, all of them were directed to come to Jerusalem for their worship. God really did not sanction any other altar. There was no other place that God had set aside for people to offer up sacrifices in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And of course, once the nation was divided after Solomon's reign, you know, the nation was divided into two different pieces we call the North Israel, or sometimes Samaria, and then the southern portion we call Judah. Sometimes the North is also called Ephraim. You'll notice that in the Minor Prophets when you're studying. So it's good to be up on that a little bit because when you study, you'll find that in different uh, parts of the Bible, it's referred to sometimes by different names. But the point is, is that even when the nation was divided and when things had gone so far uh, in a direction of captivity for the northern ten tribes, and they had actually been, many of them, carried into captivity or under the domination of Assyria, that even at a time like that, God was able to bring revival to Judah and to those in Israel who humbled themselves. And in many ways, that is the thought that is given to us here in 2 Chronicles 30. We'll read a few verses just to set the tone and then we'll do our best to unpack some of this and hopefully it'll help us in our own faith going forward. You'll notice verse number 1, And Hezekiah sent all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord of Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation of Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had, uh, for they had not done it uh, of a long time in such sort as it was written. So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah and according to the commandment of the king saying each one of Israel turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel and he will return you to the remnant of you uh, that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Syria. And be not ye like your fathers and like your brethren which trespass against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as you see. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary which he hath sanctified forever. And serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. And of course, we touched on some of these things last week and talked about initiating the turnaround. Now you and I, brethren, we can participate in the revival, the restoration that God wants to bring uh, to churches, of course, and certainly you can apply this to individuals. We know that God is able to restore uh, the lives of individuals, that's one of the great points of the gospel. They were able to go forth and let people know that even though their lives seem like that they are shipwrecked, if you will, that their lives are, are damaged incredibly. So many people are broken in this hour in which we live, but we believe in the restoration power of God. We believe God can turn things around in such a dramatic way uh, that only, uh, you know, you can only give God the glory for it, that nobody else can engineer this type of deliverance and turnaround in someone's life except for God himself. But you and I can initiate or we can be a part of a turnaround, of course, in a community, in a church, and even in a nation. And I believe there are many other believers contemplating and interceding right now and praying for America and asking that God would turn our nation around. 
I mean, a brethren, a lot of folks will say uh, still yet that, you know, these things, if God wants them, he'll just kind of do them. It's kind of the way it was when some of the modern missions got started uh, going back even uh, a couple of hundred years of church history, particularly going back to the time when some first went to India and Africa, places like that. Uh, some of the missionaries that got a burden for that and a call to go, they would come and make presentations in England, other places, and say, you know, I feel called to take the gospel to these uh, heathen nations where they know nothing of the Lord and all that. And they'd say, well, if God won't send people saved, he will, he'll, he'll say, well, you don't have to go over there. <laughs> and uh, if God wants this done or that done, you know, then he'll just do it. I mean, well, that's the position that some people take is that the Lord will just, he'll just take care of all of that and we can just stand by and just let everything happen. But I mean, oh, brethren, that's not really the teaching of Scripture is that whenever you and I know that the gospel needs to be preached in all the world, then we need to participate in it. We need to get in the middle of it. Can you say amen? The Bible teaches when this turnaround took place that much of it came about because of the obedience of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was an unusual king. In some ways, uh, Judah did have some righteous kings. And we believe that Second Chronicles records really five different reformations, or we might call them revivals. There's probably two of those were more major than others. The only sad thing about it was that, that none of these revivals lasted more than one generation. If one generation turned and got back to the Lord and cleaned out the temple and got the sacrifices started, then when that king died, it all tapered off and went away that it had to be redone again when the next king would come in or the next righteous king would come in. That if somebody came up after that king who was not a righteous king and wasn't uh, you know, really dedicated to the glory of God, then the nation would begin to drift away from the Lord. Uh, that's what you see in the book of Judges, that seven times God had to bring the nation back to himself in the book of Judges. Here in Chronicles, it's a record, of course, of the uh, reestablishment of worship and the priesthood. The book of Kings records the succession of kings and, and the kings of Israel, the northern ten tribes. There never was a righteous king. Not one righteous king out of all the kings of Israel. Once uh, Solomon had died, and after that, they began to have, to have two kings, one for the north and one for the south. The north never did have a righteous king. As a matter of fact, the king of the north, after Solomon, placed a golden calf at Dan and Beersheba to try to provide convenience for people so that they could come and worship at the golden calf. The people were first told that God just rides on the golden calf. God is invisible, but the golden calf is what God rides upon. But it wasn't too long until people put their focus on the golden calf and began to worship it rather than the invisible God. Not only that, God never told them to do that. He never sanctioned that. He never established that type of altar. The altar that God established was in Jerusalem. So Hezekiah says, look here, you need to come to Jerusalem. Could you say amen? In many ways, that is what he's giving them right at the beginning. It is a royal invitation. We read it here in the beginning verses, of course. It says, verse 5, So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba, even unto Dan. Beersheba and Dan are those two places that had the golden calf. And they also represent probably some of the extreme distances from Jerusalem, yet still in Israel. But people would have to travel a good distance to go from Dan over to Jerusalem or go from uh, Beersheba over to Jerusalem. But the king is saying, no matter where you're from, no matter how far off you are, it's time to come to the house of God. Can you say amen? In this 50th year of the West Yankton Assembly of God, as we celebrated coming down the point where we have a particular Sunday, of course, our homecoming and our 50th anniversary, brother, we want to emphasize the fact that we believe God has ordained that there be local churches. Uh, certainly the church doesn't play the role of the Old Testament temple. But I mean, no brethren, God is still establishing local churches around the world, and we believe that these local churches are in God's will. According to the book of Revelation, Jesus spoke to the pastor of various churches and sent them a word, and he said, under the churches at Pergamos, under the church at Thyatira, under these churches, these churches had God's ordination. And we claim the ordination of God for the wish and assembly of God, so we don't mind saying to people, come on up to the house of God. Can you say amen? Back then, of course, in Jerusalem, uh, the teaching of it was so strong because the temptation was for convenience was to try to create a different way to do things 
like we said with the golden calf, or they would have high heels, places wherever they could. They were establishing altars. But you'll notice when the revival gets going here with Hezekiah, they wind up tearing down all that other idolatry, all those other places like that. They tear down everything except for what is in Jerusalem that's actually dedicated to the Lord. How many brethren, whenever uh, the revival is as it should be, people begin to worship in a biblical way? Amen. They begin to obey God and worship God in the way that God said. For that Old Testament people, that meant they would have to come to Jerusalem. That was the centerpiece of what God was doing at that time when it came to the administration of the Old Testament law and in the history of Israel. That's the way that God wanted it to be. And it was necessary because you can see how easily the nation seemed to fall into this idolatry. And the idolatry was an incredible offense to Almighty God. Imagine how offensive that would be that if you had brought them out of Egypt with a high hand, if you'd been everything they needed you to be for 40 years, you'd been the clothes on their back, the food in their mouth, the shoes on their feet, their clothing hadn't worn out in 40 years, and God had been everything to them for a 40-year period, and still they turn uh, to idolatry after seeing the mighty miracles and the provision and everything else God can do. Uh, how many know, brethren, that would be offensive? Can you say amen? And we are trying our best to spare that in the lives of believers in this hour. Brethren, if we turn away from the gospel in this hour, how I many know that's a shame to the church? That is a disgrace. Isn't that true? Here's a nation that has been disgraced at this time. They've already fallen into idolatry and all that. But Hezekiah says, it's time for you to turn, time for you to come back to the house of God. He said, God uh, can turn things around. Amen. They've already seen what happened in the northern tribes. Uh, uh, of course, there's a good number of those in the northern tribes not yet carried away captive. But he's saying to them, you're going to face the reality that you need to come back to Jerusalem and turn to God. And he said that those of your family that have already been carried away captive, they will be able to be brought back to the nation, possibly. But he said, you're going to have to face the reality of what's going on. And I'm in a brother, we're having to face it. We said it last week institutional reality, we're having to face what's happening to our churches. That our churches generally in America are dwindling in numbers. There's a very small percentage of people now that tell us in America it's probably down to about one-fourth of people in America that go to church at least on a monthly basis. It's really getting down to a low percentage, which just some years ago it might have been 75% of people, probably just 30 years ago, probably 75% of people say they went to church once a month. But it's, it's dropped. And so there's, there's the reality that we have to face. And that's what uh, uh, Hezekiah is helping them to do. Because they think, you know, that by convenience, they can go out here and just offer up a little incense, and offer up a little sacrifice over at Dan, over there at Bathsheba. Hezekiah is saying, look here, I'm giving you a royal invitation. You're going to have to come to the house of God. You're going to do it God's way. You're going to have to obey the Lord if you want to see this wrath of God uh, to back off from your nation. And brethren, some of the things that we're seeing in America, we'd have to say, is probably the wrath of God. Certainly, it is the culmination of people sowing the wrong kind of seed. I mean, sometimes you want to pray for a crop failure. Yeah. I mean, after you put the wrong seed in the ground, after a while, you're like, say, hey, Lord, I, if you would grant me a crop failure here and give me a chance to plant some different kind of seed. And I don't know anybody that hadn't thought something along that line said, Lord, help me to break out of this cycle that I've been in or whatever it is. Uh, people have had to do that. And thank God that's what repentance is. And Hezekiah is calling on them uh, to repent. And of course, facing reality is a difficult thing for us as human beings. We have this tendency to want to live in denial. We'd like to sort of live in a way where we can sort of escape the reality of what is before us. I read the story of a lady who went in and was having some physical problems, and she got an x-ray, and then on the x-ray, when the doctor showed it to her, the x-ray showed some things that was not good news. And she said to the doctor, can't we just touch up the x-ray? <laughs> oh. I mean, no, brethren, touching up the x-ray is just not going to help you. <laughs> and that's what happened in a lot, you know, is that folks just want to do the superficial thing. They want to do the religious-looking thing, and uh, not really get out to the heart and the root of what's going on. And brethren, we're calling on people to examine their hearts. We're and calling on people to get honest with God. The nation of Israel needed to get honest with God. Here they've already been carried away into captivity. 
at least some of them. And they're under the domination of Assyria. And Assyria is not a country that's worshiping the God of heaven. So now they're under the domination of those who are heathen, that are without God. It's a terrible place to be for a nation who claimed to be at the covenant people of God. And certainly they were. But now they are in trouble. They're prisoners in the promised land. And it reminds us of what's happening in the church somewhat in America, around the world, that those who boast of such freedom are wound up in incredible bondage. How many know that's just not right? There's something wrong with that picture. And I'm asking God in my own life, just like Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a, a flawed person. It was obvious when you continue to read that he did some good things, but also he was flawed, and we're all uh, flawed to some degree. But I mean, oh, brethren, it ought not be that we're living in abject bondage as something I've put a lot of pressure on and emphasis on over the last uh, several years in preaching. But what we're hearing from many people is, is that as Christians, you can't really expect to be free. And people are telling young people with all the stuff that's out there now, we can't really expect you to live actually for God. We just expect you to honor him as best you can, hold on tight. Maybe somehow or another you'll make heaven your home, but uh, that you can't really expect to have any kind of victory because of all the temptation. I saw, I've heard people actually say this to young people. You know, you can't really expect that much out of anybody. Well, what about Daniel, the three Hebrew children that were sent over there, uh, you know, where that was... Uh, involved in a culture that was filled with witchcraft and every type of darkness and they had a king that was telling them what they had to do but they stood up for God in the most difficult time that you could think of we're going to have a runaway revival here now can you say amen because that you know people are using the times as an excuse we've got to get delivered from our excuses and Hezekiah sends out the message pretty much and says look here uh, I'm inviting you, whatever that would stand in the way of you coming to God, coming to his house, presenting yourself before the Lord and honoring God instead of honoring those false gods, whatever excuse you have, that excuse has been extinguished. Amen. And I mean, no, brethren, people are going to be without excuse according to the book of Romans that God has revealed himself in nature and he reveals himself to our conscience he reveals himself through the preaching of the gospel. People are going to be without excuse when they come down to the end of the way. And there is no excuse for Christian people to live a life of worldliness when the Bible gives us such a superior teaching, such sound and marvelous teaching to bring deliverance to the lives of believers. No wonder the Bible says in Luke 8, 15, that the good ground that brings forth is those who have an honest and good heart. We need to get honest with God today. Can you say amen? And sometimes it can be heartbreaking. Sometimes I'm broken somewhat as I come before the Lord. I'm saying, God, I'm walking with a limp already. I've wrestled with you. You have prevailed. I've had your blessings. I want to continue to have your blessings. But God, uh, there is some brokenness here. I mean, oh, brother, it'd be better to be humbled and broken than to be humiliated ultimately because of your own pride. Yes. Now, I mean, oh, that's what brings humiliation is the aftermath of pride. And uh, pride would cause them not to come to Jerusalem. Pride would cause them not to obey the word of God and what was given them from the moment they were given the temple. You remember when the temple was given, the Solomon dedicated the temple, and we have this passage of scripture, you know, that so many people are familiar with, from 2 Chronicles 7, where the Bible talks about humbling ourselves before God. He said, when you see certain things come to pass in the land, he says, that's a sign that you need to humble yourself before the Lord and turn from your wicked ways and seek God and that God would heal the land. Matter of fact, it gives it, uh, going back all the way to verse 11, about that in verse uh, 2 Chronicles 7, it says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his house he prospered, uh, prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to them, I've heard that prayer. And I've chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Then he says, if I shut up heaven. So sometimes we just give that verse 14. And that's not wrong. We need to give that verse 14. Which it says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. But he said, here's a good sign. This is how you can figure out if you need to do this. If, he, if there's not any rain. And he said, if the locusts devour the land. You're having to compete with the locusts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner then that's, that's a good sign you need to pray. And then he says, if I send pestilence among the people. 
He said, you know, you ought to be able to put two and two together. <laughs> you don't need a blue ribbon panel to come out and try to figure out what's happening. He said, if you see these things going on, it's time to humble yourself before God and it's time to turn away from wicked ways, he says, to pray and seek my face and turn from our wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This was a part of the dedication of the house of God. So that house was put there that temple was put there not as something for them to worship and not for them to count just as a good luck charm. As long as we got the temple, we won't have any trouble. We can just kind of do whatever we want to do. That was not the spirit of it. The spirit of it was that he said, if you see that things are not going right, you know you need to gather back at the house of God, fall on your knees, turn from those things that have crept into the land, whatever it is that's gotten into people's lives. Turn away from that. He said, then I will hear their land. He says, verse 15, now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Uh, brethren, to me this is a powerful message. We see that there is a, a wonderful royal invitation. But then there's a clear admonition that Hezekiah sends out. He doesn't wait till they get there to deliver the message. He has these messengers when it says post there. It says that the post went out, verse 6, went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout Israel and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, you children of Israel, turn again to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you. He could just send out a letter, come, we got a lot of food, we're going to try our best to get you here. <laughs> He just goes and tells them, you know, we want you to come, but you're going to have to return unto Abraham, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said that's what it's all about. This is not somebody that is, you know, just trying to make points politically. You know, there was a political stress here because you've got a king now up there in the northern tribes, or ultimately will have one that he doesn't, uh, you know, they've, they've had them for years. Now Assyria has taken over, but uh, they've had this situation before where there are families up there, relatives of the royalty of Israel that doesn't want anybody to go down to Judah. And so there's this conflicting thing going on. But did you know the Bible says that many of them humbled themselves, humbled themselves, and went on down to the house of God, even though they didn't live nearby, they weren't in Jerusalem, they weren't in Judah, which is right around the southern portion of Jerusalem. They weren't there, but the Bible says they humbled themselves and came out of the mountains. The Bible says some people humbled themselves and others mocked. If you'll notice in the scriptures here, uh, that if you read uh, further down, it actually says that some of them mocked and that others, uh, that they humbled themselves. And in this hour, that's what's going to go on. Some are going to mock and others are going to humble themselves and, and answer uh, to God uh, as they should. And we pray that that's what will happen. I pray that I'll have the kind of heart and spirit to set the right kind of example for our brethren here at West Shack. And I'm uh, trying to do my very best uh, not to make somehow exalt myself or somehow insert myself in a way that God never intended. I'm here to tell you I'm seeking God myself. I'm asking God to help me. I'm asking God uh, to help my testimony, that my testimony be as strong as possible in the midst and I'll be a man of complete integrity and above reproach and that's what God requires out of ministers and, and all Christians for that matter and brethren this is the hour in which we need it if folks are ever going to do anything for the Lord now is the time to get after it if folks are going to honor the Lord and be identified with him this is the hour to do so just as it was then this is a situation in the nation there where they they need a turnaround and ultimately, Judah survives another 136 years after Israel has already gone into captivity, the northern ten tribes. Uh, but, but ultimately, even Judah is carried away captive also. You would like to think they would learn from all the heartache and the death and the disease and the damage and the pestilence and everything else that took place with Israel. You think Judah would get the message. And of course, even at this time, not long after this, the king comes into Judah and occupies 46 cities. And one night an angel walks through where those uh, alien armies are 
and kills 185,000 of them in one night. And Judah is delivered because of the powerful angel that came into the midst and caused that deliverance to take place. As a result, Judah made it 136 years after Israel was gone into captivity. But even they, ultimately, they've got the temple, they've got the Lord, they've had revival and everything else, and even they ultimately bow their knee uh, to those false gods and wind up into captivity. It's enough to make the angels weep. Isn't that right? But we're looking at a, a microcosm of time. We're looking at a little piece of time when Hezekiah as uh, recorded three chapters in Chronicles here, is able to lead a revival and a reformation in the land. We said to you that in the book of Kings, there's only one verse about Hezekiah having this reform and revival because Kings is looking at it from the viewpoint of the Kings. But in Chronicles, we're looking at it from the viewpoint of worship and the temple and the people of God coming back before the Lord, worshiping God in all honesty, worshiping God with real Humility. Brethren, as you know, if you're not careful when it comes to religion, religion will just be actually false humility. That's why we detest religion. Sometimes people talk about religion in our church in such a way because we know that religion can be just the superficial. It can be just what's seen on the outside. It can be that thing where people draw nigh to, people, nigh to God with their, with their lips, but their hearts are being far from them. The Bible does speak about pure religion and undefiled before God. But how I many know there's a lot of religion that's defiled? Are you out there? Paul the Apostle had people worshiping idols when he went down to Mars Hill. And he said, I noticed that all of you down here, you're just so superstitious. But when you look that up in the Greek, he said, uh, you people are so religious. <laughs> what is he thinking about? It's that superficial religion that's at false show of humility that's not real humility so when the scriptures say humble yourself in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14 uh, to be able to have the land healed you have to humble yourself how I many of you really can't humble yourself without obeying the Lord humility would lead to the natural obedience to whatever God said for them to do and God had told them to come back to his house present themselves before the Lord to bring their families. The men would have to come at Passover and they would have to come at Pentecost and they would have to come uh, you know, later in the year as well to, the, uh, to the other, some of the other gatherings that they had. They had these seven major gatherings, but these men had to come to at least three of those. And of course what they're doing is, is presenting themselves on behalf of their whole family. Many times their whole family was with them. But they're saying, Lord, you're the one that's blessed us. Yeah. That we haven't done this with our own hands, with our own power. It's not the river God or the moon God or the rain God. or the. It's not Baal. You know, Baal uh, was a God that uh, was symbolized by thunder and lightning. He's supposed to be the rain God to make things fertile so you can have food. That's why it's kind of funny in a way. There's a little humor to it. That while he's up on Mount Carmel with Elijah, uh, the the prophets of Baal up are crying out for a little bit of thunder and lightning because they want the lightning to light up the sacrifice, to light up the, the wood that's on the on the sacrifice of the that they put out there. So they're jumping around, carrying on like it, everything, you know, trying to get trying to get a little lightning going. Baal and Asheroth. Asheroth was the uh, the female counterpart to Baal. And these were the two gods of being worshipped. That's pagan uh, gods, that's paganism. But whenever they would come before the Lord to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the city of peace, it's the ordained of God. The worship that David brought forth was ordained of God, and God commemorated David for it and said, this man is a man after my own heart. And so God took that Davidic worship and what was going on in the temple and just brought it into the future. And so therefore, uh, any group after that, if they wanted to come back and really serve God, they would have to follow the example that was given by David and the law that was given by Moses. David was about worship all from the heart. We know he had his problems, but God ordained that type of worship. And then the law was to be kept. And of course, uh, they would need to keep the law meticulously. And at this time, you'll notice that when they couldn't keep the Passover during the first month, God let them uh, take care of it in the second month because that's when they were actually prepared to do it. And so they went ahead and had it in the second month. 
letting us know, brethren, that the matters of the heart, and when people are devoted completely from the heart, that that overrules uh, keeping the letter of the law. See, people don't get to the place where they keep the letter of the law, but then it's superficial. It's that false humility. They're really worshiping the law instead of worshiping the God who gave the law. Hello? <laughs> so he let them have Passover the second week. And in the midst of it, they had revival. Marvelous, if you'll notice, we'll read the last few verses of this chapter, because this is really what I want to get to, and this is what I'm believing God for, for our nation, for our area, and coming down into this 50th year, somehow or another, this just really uh, speaks to me, because we're asking God for beautiful renewal and restoration. Here at Weshek, and the Bible says, in verse number 17, I believe it is, it says, For there were many in the congregation who were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passovers for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh and Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one. They just couldn't kill enough animals to take care of all the Passover. Remember how the Passover was in Egypt? Every house had to have the lamb, eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roofed with fire, its head with the legs, and with the purpose thereof. And you shall let none of it remain into the morning. You shall eat it with the staff in your hand and the shoes on your feet. I mean, if God tells you to eat with staff in your hand, shoes on your feet, that means you're going somewhere. Can you say amen? This is no regular meal. Hello. <laughs> This is an amazing covenant relationship with Almighty God. And here they're brought into that again. But the, being they could not do all the things that the letter of the law said when it comes to killing every sacrifice, Hezekiah said, Lord, just purify them all, cause them all to be cleansed so they can participate in it. And the Bible says, I, he prayed, Lord, pardon everyone. And verse 19, that prepareth his heart to seek God. Lord, clean all of those up. Bring a cleansing, pardon everybody who prepareth his heart to seek God. How many know that's what the Lord really wants out of us anyway? Yes. The Bible says all of the animals that could be killed would never satisfy God anyway. That's not what really satisfies the Lord. What satisfies God is when people have a heart prepared to seek the Lord. Here you see it just laid right out in front of you that uh, certainly God wanted them to keep the letter of the law to some degree. Uh, we see that, you know, he had certain things and a purpose for all of that. But the one thing that uh, trumped that was the idea of a heart prepared to serve God. So even though they couldn't get the time of the year just right and they could not kill enough animals, how many of God met with them and gave them revival and gave them renewal? And God knows what we can do here at Wayshaken and the things we can't do. How many of God has been making up the difference for the people of God for many thousands of years? Can you say amen? And I'm saying, Lord, make up the difference right here at Weshek, and there's some things we can't do, some things evidently, you know, that uh, uh, the people want out of us sometimes that we can't do. Uh, we notice that in some cases that uh, uh, there's a tremendous growth with churches uh, whenever they do certain things for the community. But the real question is, when it's all said and done, are we obeying God is the real question. And are we producing real disciples, people that are actually seeking the Lord? So we're asking God to make up the difference. I mean, his presence and power is something we need. There is no substitute for the power of the living God. So other folks, they can have everything else. And they, you know, if that's what they're determined to have, they can have that. But give us God's presence. Let us have the power of God. Let us have renewal and revival in the old time way. Can you say amen? Where people come onto the property and begin to sense the strangeness and the awesomeness of the presence of Almighty God. And people come through the doors and there's an inspiration within them to make them want to let a praise escape their lips. Could you let a little praise escape your lips this morning and say, you know what, i got to praise him. I'm in his house. I'm in his wheel. I love him. I worship him. I'm going to praise his name this morning. Can you say amen? Glory to God. I tell you, these folks here, they wound up having a beautiful move of God. Notice these last three verses, and the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. Here's a God who will respond and heal the land. Here he healed the people. We're believing God for healing in America. People need so much healing. 
Everywhere I go, I hear all these stories about all the things that are happening, the broken lives and the broken relationships. And every one of us have experienced some of it to some degree. We would have to say, yes, we need healing. Well, let's believe God for it. I mean, we have faith for the things that are preached to us, the things that we hear the Word of God about, we're more likely to have faith for. Well, this morning we're exercising our faith for a turnaround. Can you say amen? For a revival that we believe that God is going to allow His church to participate in the revival and renewal that He has for the nation. Amen. You'll notice this. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness. They're not just going through the motions. There's gladness in this thing. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. Y'all can quiet down a little bit. God's not hard of hearing. God's not hard of hearing, somebody said. Then somebody answered back and said, he's not nervous either. <laughs> You can get loud once in a while. Sometimes you get quiet. How I many of you don't make a God out of either one of those things? Some places you go, you've not had church unless you get loud. And other places you go, you haven't had church unless you get quiet. I mean, of God, the Holy Ghost is uh, such a, uh, a God that he can, he can deal with people in such a way. Sometimes you're going to get quiet. Other times you're going to get loud. It's all going to be in order if it's inspired of God, mandated by the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord, and they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. I mean, when you get people making confession, you must be having revival. When people begin to acknowledge where they missed it and saying, Lord, I need you, and God, I forsake these things. I don't want this to be a part of my life anymore. You'll always know when you're having revival because people start coming clean before God. Amen. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, you can write my life in the sky. He said, you, he said, you can write it and I don't have anything to hide. Amen. Notice the very next uh, several verses here. It says that they got together, the whole assembly, everybody there, they're moving together in such a spirit of unity that they say, I tell you what, let's go another seven days. Let's extend the revival for seven more days. <laughs> and so they go on it and keep it again for seven more days. And the Bible teaches that Hezekiah gave a bunch of animals and, his, and the princes, the princes, they all gave animals uh, for the sacrifices. And the Bible says uh, that uh, they gave sacrifices even for the strangers. The drug. They're having evangelism. People are coming to God who are not even Jewish. We're seeing this joy and gladness, what have you, and they're beginning to honor the God of uh, Judah. Uh, and, of course, what's supposed to have been the God of Israel. Of course, there are many Israelites that are there. It says so in this passage. It says uh, that came out of Israel, the strangers that came out of the land of Israel, and that dwelt in Judah rejoiced. So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Since the kingdom had been divided, they had not had this type of unified Passover or what have you. But now God, in the impossible circumstances, brought them back together to worship together like this, so much so that even the, the heathen are being influenced and are coming to God. Verse 27, then the priests... Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up uh, to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. Uh, they're having their prayers heard. God is answering. The priests are blessing the people. Can you say amen? I'm here to tell you, brethren, all this is possible. Somebody, you know, it'd be easy to say in this hour, you can't have this anymore. That's what somebody would have said back then. I said, look here, you can't have this anymore. The kingdom is divided. The Syria has come in. You can't have revival anymore. They had it anyway. Can you say amen? With God's blessing and God answering prayer, they knew that their prayers were going up before God's holy habitation in heaven. According to this passage of scripture, we read it. His holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. I mean, if you know you're getting prayers through, <laughs> I mean, oh, that's a big piece of revival right there. When you know that as a congregation, God is answering prayer and blessing. And the Bible says the priests began to bless. You know what that blessing was? It was number 6, 22 through 27. And the Bible says that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and his son, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. They had been blessed like that. Somebody said, does it matter? I believe it matters whether or not you're blessed. But they haven't been blessed like that in a long time because they haven't been even having the temple worship or the priest there or anything like that. Now the people are being blessed. Uh, years ago I came across where they, they were searching in Israel as they often do. There's a lot of archaeological digs. They found a lot of things, but they found this little tiny silver cylinder. There's really a couple of them. They were really like little scrolls, you know, that uh, they, it was metallic, though that it was made out of, and they were very, very old, of course, like so many things would be from Israel, but they dug that out, and they were afraid to just try to unroll it right away because to see what was written on it because, you know, it's all that age. Where so they, over a number of months, uh, you know, had the experts to treat it, to do what you had to do, to try to feel like they could unroll it and see what was on that, that little silver scroll. Of course, there's some large scrolls that are over there. The Dead Sea Scrolls is something they found right after World War II. Had everything in the Bible in it except for the book of Esther. Had a complete book of Isaiah in it. And all those scrolls were stored inside little pots. But this particular metal scroll, and I think it was actually, if I remember right, there was two small ones that whenever they got it unrolled, this was what was on that scroll. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and uh, give thee peace. Amen. I tell you what, brethren, I'd rather have the blessings of God than anything I can think of. And if that means I've got to humble myself, if that means I've got to go beyond just the superficial idea of uh, religion, then I'm all right with that because I don't want just a little touch of religion anyway. A lot of folks think a little dab is going to do you. <laughs> Honey, it's not doing people. <laughs> it's not meeting the need. People having just a little dab of religion are more miserable than anybody else. That's true. Got just enough Jesus to stay out of jail, but not enough to stay out of hell. That's right. Amen. That's what one preacher said years ago. Got just enough religion to stay out of a jail, but not enough to stay out of hell. <laughs> are you out there? <laughs> I mean, really, we want to go wholeheartedly and say, Lord, whatever you'd have for us in this time to come. We live in a very serious hour. It doesn't mean we can't smile or, or be happy or have any humor at all. But, brethren, the seriousness of it is, is that uh, mankind has fallen for a false humility, a false religion. And, brethren, we need the real thing. We need a real turnaround in our lives. Amen. Let's stand on our feet today and honor the Holy Spirit. Ask for him to move and bless and meet needs. And we're calling upon everyone. Just obey the Lord. Doesn't mean you have to come and tell us what all the Lord is uh, dealing with you about and all that, but we encourage you to talk to the Lord. We believe that every person can talk to the Lord directly and can respond to the Holy Spirit with conviction and, and receive wonderful restoration in their lives. As we bow before God's presence, let's worship together now and ask for God's help. And let's pray for those who stand in need of restoration that may not be with us today, those who have been watching. It could be any number of families and people, individuals, things that we don't even know about and may never know about, but God knows and can bring deliverance. Our Father God, we just pray for those that stand in need today, God, of a real turnaround in their lives. Father God, you have blessed and ministered all through the years. Father, you've kept us and helped us here in America. And Father God, we want to go beyond any superficial religion, uh, any public show of humility just to uh, put on that show, Father God. We know that that's not what it is you're looking for, but the real humility of the heart, Father. We pray, Father, that ours will be sincere and genuine, Father, that uh, more than just going along with a religious crowd, Father, we want to be moved by your spirit and obey your word. And Father, we want to do so whether it's popular or unpopular, in season or out of season, oh God, we call upon your name. And we want to be identified with those, Father God, that gather in your house and call upon you, that worship you freely, oh God. And Father, we thank you for deliverance today for those 
outside possibly of this service today, but across the countryside here, Father, there may be those that are battling addictions, those struggling, Father God, with things that are almost unspeakable. But Father God, you're well able to bring deliverance and recovery to them today. And we give you thanks for doing so. In Jesus' wonderful name, help us, Father God, to be uh, powerful evangelists for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name.